on Facebook and on Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us for our Thursday webinar. I'm Liz Perry, uh, Crow Canyon's president, and I am also joined uh, with a co-moderator today, um, Mr. John Gahate, who is a new educator at Crow Canyon and will become a familiar face on our webinars. Uh, John, do you want to say hello to the folks? Sure. Uh, first of all, Gwatsi in my mother's language and Kashe in my father's language. Greetings to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And we're really looking forward for an exciting and interesting discussion with our guests today. Wonderful. Thanks so much, John. Um, uh, we will go into some more detail about our speaker, but before we uh, get started, we like to begin with our land acknowledgement for uh, Crow Canyon Archaeological Center's campus. Um, we acknowledge the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands our institution sits. Our mission-related work at Crow Canyon would not be possible without Indigenous people in the past, present, and future, and we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant Indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. We are grateful to all Indigenous people, and we support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. I think our next slide, yes, um, just kind of along those lines, uh, Crow Canyon, as we mentioned, uh, our mission is entirely in support of uh, indigenous history. We are so grateful to our partners. We also have had some incredible um, uh, interns lately in our American Indian Initiatives Department that have been helping expand our online indigenous resources. Please check this out on our website. We have, um, listed universities with related studies and student unions, um, indigenous organizations, um, uh, access to native media, um, tribal homepages and websites. Please check it out and give us some feedback on what else might be useful to you uh, on our website. And thank you to everyone. There's so many people registered for this for this webinar and for all of our webinars and so many people made gifts. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We are entirely supported by donations and all of you make this possible for us. <laughs> all right, I know people are very familiar with Zoom. Thank you all for continuing to use Zoom. Um, please go ahead and, and put your questions in the Q&A instead of the chat. If you remember, we'll scan the chat, but sometimes things can get lost as people talk to each other. If you're having any difficulty with Zoom, we are streaming live on Facebook. And you can also check out our YouTube channel for this and previous talks. We have some, uh, as usual, some incredible webinars coming up. We have next week on June 29th, Farming the Hopi Way, Early Agriculture, Cuisine, and Community. Uh, with Ruben Sineski and Stuart Koyi Yemtua. We're extremely, Stuart is a member of our advisory committee and uh, Ruben is a new, a, a former intern and new employee at Crow Canyon. Uh, the week after that, we're going to a blast from the past, uh, the Dolores Archaeological Program, which uh, some of our viewers have probably heard about, maybe even worked for uh, one of the, the largest, still largest uh, contract archaeological um, projects that in the Southwest, possibly in North America, that uh, really launched a lot of the careers of people uh, at Crow Canyon uh, 40 years ago. So we have our uh, current chair, uh, Ricky Lightfoot, uh, and, and others of our uh, of our of our prior leadership that will be um, uh, talking about the DAP and some of our history the week after that, July 6th. All right, without further ado, we are incredibly grateful uh, to be able to introduce to you uh, James Rattling Leaf Sr., who is a principal at the uh, Wolakota Lab, who serves as a guide to organizations to work more effectively with Indigenous peoples for a more equitable world, something that is uh, right in line with what we're trying to do at Crow Canyon uh, and in line with our mission. He specializes in developing programs that utilize the interface between Indigenous people's traditional knowledge and Western science. He has over 25 years experience serving as a cross-cultural broker, uh, resource to federal government agencies, higher education institutions, and nonprofits to developing and maintaining positive ongoing working relationships with federally and non-federally recognized Indian tribes, tribal colleges and universities, and tribal communities. He was born on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and is an enrolled member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. James, thank you so much. Uh, we are really excited, all of our staff at Crow Canyon and our viewers uh, to be able to learn from you and uh, hopefully continue to work with you in the future to achieve our goals too. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Liz, for that um, 
that kind of introduction again and and uh, again welcome to the webinar uh, i'm glad to see uh, interest uh, in this topic and we have we look forward to having a, a good time together today so with that i'm going to share my screen it's always a adventure um for me to do that <laughs> kind of stuff but uh let me share my screen here and make sure that we're uh we're all in a good place here and and so just uh let me know here how i'm doing you're coming through clear on our end how's that look am i in my uh so if you want to click display settings at the top there and just swap presenter mode um should be at the very top of your screen so under display settings we'll have you swap presenter mode there and then we'll be all set yep okay. you know well great well thank you again uh, for everybody for being uh being here today and again as was mentioned um uh, let me begin by introducing myself in the in, in my way in the Lakota way. We say how many dakia pi chante washte na pe chusapolo James Rallingly pi machi api na si chango Lakota oyatehi. Um, I greet you today uh, from my heart uh, with a handshake. I'm known as James Rallingly, and I'm a member of the Little Bit Sioux Tribe. And I appreciate uh, these opportunities to come and speak about something that I think is important. Uh, I think it's very relevant and in in our time, the things that we're dealing with as a, as humankind. Uh, the issues uh, that we face, like climate change, for instance, uh, requires, I think, a, a new way to think about something called traditional knowledge and traditional collective knowledge. And so it happens, the picture I show you here is uh, is the um, is uh, um, Fort Wachiki uh, Canyon on the Wind River Indian Reservation in Wyoming. I was just there this past weekend during Father's Day and took this picture. And again, as a reminder uh, to me, as I as I go on to landscape and I do this kind of work and I'm part of a culture yet that still uh, values and honors uh, places and uh, the stories of these places and these landscapes um, are still alive and well. And so I um, I use and, and think about these things all the time. And um, so it's important that we, uh, we get ready in a way uh, to think about uh, the topic today and also how we uh, will interact and how we'll come into a, a place and a space to uh, through respect and reciprocity, uh, relationality, and um, responsibility. So as was mentioned, um, I uh, I get to be part of some pretty cool projects. And so the graphic I show you here is part of some organization I'm working with right now. Obviously, the top one is my own consulting company. Uh, the next one, the blue one there, is the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. The middle is the flag of my tribe, the Rose Two Tribe. The next one to that is NIDUS or NOAA NIDUS, the National Integrated Job Information System. And the last graphic there, it's just, you know, just as part of my portfolio, is called the Environmental Science Innovation Inclusion Lab. And that's a new, uh, new environmental data science center um, located at, at the University of Colorado Boulder. And uh, I serve as a tribal uh, liaison to that new center. And so we're just completing our first year of a five year project. Again, it's working and supporting the inclusion. Of indigenous people uh, working with environmental science data. So today I want to start with um, tribal colleges. And so when we talk about traditional knowledge, uh, I'm rem I'm remindful uh, mindful of where I came from, who I am, and what 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 people what institution invested in me to bring me here today. So Cynthia Glesky University is a university that where I went to school and graduated from. Also spent nine years working there um, to advance um, the importance of of STEM. At the time, it was um, geographic information systems, what I was working on to build a program there and also to work with earth system science. But it's important to understand again, the, the role of tribal colleges in my life and the work of, of, of working with traditional knowledge. So, so this is a graphic that I always like to remind myself as well as others, the importance of culture and higher ed and the importance of our own uh, view of higher education as Lakota people and the importance of our values and uh and going forward and how we do the higher education so i'm i'm mindful of that always i take the institution with me wherever i go and it's important uh, in in my work uh when we talk about traditional knowledge and science and technology i like to use this graphic of the connection point between the audience and what we're doing how we approach uh, new things so these are three men on a hill each one of them each one given the responsibility of gathering information we'd say gathering data uh to help make a decision 
And so you have three men on a horse. The title of this graphic is looking for the next campsite. And what I what I use it for is to, again, how did we bring in new things uh, to our cultures? How did we uh, advance new thinking into our cultures? And especially things like tools of technology. How did we work with that? Uh, from what I understand, with our own Lakota cultures. And so you have you have them, you have three men on a horse. And one of the things that we did as Lakota culture is we made the horse a relative of ours. So we gave it a name. Uh, we gave it a role again and became a very part of our culture. Uh, we also see a man with a gun. And um, though we did not make the gun a relative, uh, we did did we did bring in those new technologies into our cultures. And so having a framework of how our culture has brought in new things and, and to do that to survive, do that to thrive and, and do that to uh, create a new way for our people as things are changing. Uh, in our in our times there, and so these are important. These are men who are given responsibility um, for gathering information for decision makers. So that was their role, and so they had the task of doing that, gathering it in an appropriate way, in a respectful way, but also it had to be accurate, it had to be true, and it had to be uh, useful to decision makers. And so now today we have this uh, we have satellite now technology and other ways to gather information. So we again are in this really important time. So how do we work with data? How do we work with science in terms of our cultures? And so that's the things that we're gonna be talking about today are some examples through story. And so we begin with our president, the late Dr. Lionel Bordeaux, who really gave me the charge uh, with this particular quote. Uh, he said, Simpton Glesca University was started by its founding fathers to strengthen the Sichangu nation in all aspects of life. As such, this initiative will assist us in bringing together two essential points of life, the earth and the sky. Uh, to together spiritually and technically. So this was really my charge when I asked him, we wanted to build this capability at our tribal colleges, which was never done before. And this is what he told me. And so I carry this quote uh, with me. I, I carry his leadership um, support and the memory of his leadership and how we were bringing uh, at the time uh, geographic information systems into, into our university. And so we did that through agreements. We did that through what we call Wolakota or a new way of doing business. This is a picture of the of, of senior leadership of the United States Geological Survey. And this was this happened in 2000, 23 years ago. And so I look a little bit different there um, 23 years ago, but you know, I was brand new coming out of the university, getting my really my first job. And, and then I was given the task to help put together this agreement because we wanted the USGS uh, to support us in our development of our new lab, our new programs around GIS. Uh, if you know uh, history of USGS, uh, one of their big uh, data centers is in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, called Aeros Data Center. So we wanted to work with Aeros Data Center, and we felt that in order to do that, we needed to formalize a relationship. So you'll find these tribes and, and organizations want to work together. Uh, it's useful to have these agreements. So we were looking at it at kind of a new treaty or a new agreement, a new MOU between a univers tribal university and the U.S. government, like the USGS. And so we did that. And so we used our culture, our traditional knowledge to advance this, this event. And so we signed an agreement. That's uh, my president and Chip Grote, the USGS director. Uh, we also had um, our, our elders and our, and our Lakota studies um, leadership uh, participate and help guide uh, the implementation of this agreement through ceremony and through community uh, engagement. And so that picture uh, is of the Lady Albert White Hat with the headdress and the eagle feather fan. And what's interesting to me why I include this picture is because that's a satellite image of Rosebud, uh, Rosebud Sioux Reservation, uh, Landsat 7. And so there really wasn't, to my knowledge, uh, ever a graphic of that ever presented uh, to the tribe or to the tribal colleagues. So the connection between data, earth observations, and our culture uh, began there for me as we did begin to do this work together. And out of that work became a product called ResMapper. And so we wanted to, uh, to bring our knowledge, traditional knowledge, into the earth system science um, sphere. And so we had our elders help us define what GIS was and they came up with this definition, which I think is important when we, when we talk about traditional knowledge is the role of, of uh, indigenous languages. So if you see it in orange there, it says Uchi Maka Naha, Uchapi Oyate Naha, Wamakashka Oyate, Wolakoto Gusutapi. So that's translated into um, Mother Earth and Star Nation and all living things, um, all living things nations, 
working together for so looking working together to support each other. In Sutapi, it means to strengthen one another. So that's how an elder interpreted GIS for us at the time. And so it was very important that that we we had that foundation. And so we did this product, the data viewer uh, product uh, with the government, with the tribe, with the tribal college, with elders and some software developers that helped us with it. And as, as of note, that other image there to the side is uh, is taken from uh, from the from the uh, space station, and this was when uh, sent, uh, satellite, uh, excuse me, astronaut John Harrington, the first American Indian astronaut to go in space. We asked him to take a picture of the Black Hills, which is very sacred to our people and to many other tribes. And so you can see it right there in the corner there. That's the Black Hills, and so we were very honored to receive that that image from him. Uh, we honored him for that, and we're grateful for him and all those that are working uh, to advance uh, American Indian peoples. And so we used what we call a social memory approach to build the Res Mapper product. Uh, we did interviews uh, with our elders, our knowledge holders. We collected that information. Uh, we recognized their expertise. We both looked at a local and regional perspective. We wanted to honor our history of, and our connection to the environment. Uh, again, we promoted the observation of the natural world. We recognize again through our culture that all things are related or Midakuya Oyasi, all things are connected. And so we also wanted to, to promote the idea of seven generations ahead, that what we do today it, it impacts or will, can impact, will impact the next seven generations. So our decisions today um, mean something. And so whatever we do, we know that we got to keep that in mind. And so these are just a screenshot of some of the images there. We we brought together many different data sources, which was the goal of the project, is how do we bring these different data sources together? We had historical imagery. Uh, we had the typical USGS data sources like uh, DRGs and uh, satellite imagery. But also, we were able to secure uh, spy satellite or um, spy satellite called ortho uh, photography. So in the 50s, you know, our government flew spy missions over our country. And so we were able to secure that data once it got declassified and included it in ResMapper, which is really interesting because we showed the community pictures of the community back in the 1950s and they and they they love that because they begin to tell stories of what the place used to be like and again it was a good uh invitation to, to the data and, and what it means but also connecting oral tradition to the place and so we also included our um, our community histories and we included the 20 communities on rosebud and so again it was uh at that time, it was we believe it was very innovative because it brought many different data sources together to recognizing the importance of, of including uh, different ways of knowing. And so because of that, we find ourselves today. Um, so a lot of my work today, we I work with data. So these are questions, I think, for us as um, people who work with data, work with tribes and to think about, right? So we are always reminded about nation building. How do our tribes build nations uh, with data? Um, how do we do better in terms of collecting data with on our own people, but also third parties? Again, what are those challenges and opportunities to build what we call data tribal data governance? What do those systems look like? You know, how do we store the data? How do we disseminate data? What are the policies needed? What are the tribal codes we need uh, to strengthen that? Again, how do we build a community of practice, a data tribal data sovereignty? You know, how do we share our, our best practices, our good practices, with one another? Again. Because we live in a, a, a time now where we can be, and we are very interconnected uh, through technology, you know, how do we share that? What organizations do we go through? What do we need to build to achieve these things? Plus, also don't forget our international, our global indigenous partners who are also working on the same kind of issues with data. So those are things that I think are important that we need to ask ourselves. And so we understand why we have to ask those questions because of the past, right? Because that in the past, you know, a lot of this data collection was, was driven by others, someone else's agenda. Somebody else took control of the data. They took ownership of it without really our consent. A lot of the times it was, was not built on respectful relationships and there was not any of our, our protocols or our values, our perspectives or our worldviews in that. We did not have pre and prior informed consent at that time. And still the data wasn't really what we really needed. It was some based on somebody else's needs. So, we think that the data was inconsistent, irrelevant, and of poor quality. Again, it was taken out of context uh, because it was driven by someone else's needs. And so the research at that time, as we say, didn't reflect who we are as indigenous people. So we were working to change that. 
And that's why these questions about data and the Indonesian people are very important. So in some ways, in our ways, as the Lakota people, we still rely on the trust responsibility. So that has to be part of it. We need to build our capacity within any country to use data. So on my tribe, uh, we uh, we have a $45 million investment from the federal government, from the Biden first administration to build out uh, in five counties in South Central South Dakota, the first ever tribally led, tribally owned and tribally directed uh, uh, wireless broadband infrastructure. So that's important. That's the first step we've ever done that. So we're, how are we gonna use that data? infrastructure to advance economic development, healthcare, education, uh, and research. I think, you know, when we do this, we know that it's costly. It's, it's, it's $45 million to do this. So how are we going to maintain that? So those are questions yet we're still um, working on. Again, um, we need to build trust. A lot of work that I see is still a lack of trust between tribes and federal government. Again, how do we work with third, third party uh, researchers and organizations that don't want to work with us? We know that our land tenure system is affected by this because, um, uh, because of the current land tenure system, at least on our reservation. And so there are non-Indians that live within our borders. A lot of them don't adhere to our jurisdiction. So we know that's a complicated matter, but we know that that's our reality. How do we, how do we develop better ways to work with those folks in terms of protecting our water, uh, or dealing with climate change, dealing with drought, those kind of issues? I think we need to build a tribal data workforce. We need a model. Well, how do we do that both at the local level, but also regional and national level? What are those things that we need to do as institutions, partnerships, and even as individuals to build a workforce by working with our young people to get them ready? And also I think that inter-tribal collaboration is important. Uh, we need to learn from one another. We have our, our different diversity, but also we know that there's some commonalities and some principles that we can build upon. And so that we wanna facilitate tribal innovation especially around data. And so that's important to us. And so when we talk about data and traditional knowledge, I, I'm always reminded of kind of this point in time, right? This is a, what we call a winter count. And this is a winter count, again, that displays information and knowledge about, uh, about important things that happen to our tribal people. And so this was, this was given to a person uh, to do this work. Uh, he was responsible, he or she was responsible for documenting important events in our tribe. So these are some examples, again, from a winter count that's still preserved today. It's in many times, these are in museums. You may see them. I would encourage you to, to look at this, again, as another way uh, to articulate important events, important things, but it's a way to also intergenerational transfer knowledge uh, to today. And what can we learn from these things that will help us inform the future? Those are important questions. So we want to make sure that we uh, include winter counts and, and, and those processes that were useful uh, to our ancestors and to us today. And so in our in our work at Rosebud, uh, here's an example again of how we're bringing together traditional knowledge with climate change and science. So when we began to work with climate change, and that was one of my projects with my own tribe, was to create a vision statement. What, why are we doing this again in the first place? And this is what we came up with. It was something that I think that was important for us to engage with all the community of our tribe so that they know what we're doing. And so the importance of connecting it to our, our culture and to our language again was important. So here's a statement from, uh, from a ceremony that we do at Lakota people. And I thought, and our leadership thought it was important to include this vision statement and to talk about it, you know, as we get ready uh, to go forward um, uh, with our planning. So out of that came this plan called the Tichanga Lakota Yate Climate Nation Plan. And I share this again because we brought together different ways of knowing together. And these are the key recommendations. Uh, the first one was to ensure focus and accountability. So we find ourselves within our tribe today still the need for a better government, for a better government system. The current government is not our government. It was imposed upon us. So how do we, how do we still work with that today, knowing that it doesn't really meet all our needs, but yet we still have to work with it? And so one of the things that they told us, again, that the planning effort, and this work was done during the COVID period. So the last two years, it was very challenging to do this plan, but we did our best to do it. So this is, again, a, a data point, if you will, a milestone, if you will, in our development as a tribe to work with climate. So we wanted to look at, and they wanted us to look at accountability for our government. The second point was they wanted to protect the Oyate or the people of the nation. That was a big, important thing because we've gone through some pretty severe weather events uh, this past few years on the Rosebud. 
And so we recognize again that these things are happening. So what, what's this plan? How's this plan can help protect the people? Water became a very important uh, sector of this work in terms of drought. So that was highlighted again, protecting our water. So we have a plan called the drought response plan. The tribe, the community wanted us to implement that plan. And finally, again, protecting our sovereignty. And through that, we want to establish an environmental data and, and, uh, and, and climate uh, decision center on the rules. But again, so this will happen. Uh, we secured a, a $1.7 million climate resilience plan from the BIA to build this new center. So this is the first year of that planning. And so in a year from now, we'll have, we'll have um, not only a plan, but we'll have a strategy. We'll have leadership in place. We'll have an advisory group in place and we'll have a research agenda. And so part of that is to share what we wanna do with the center. And so you'll see these key, key, key components to the center, what it's gonna do. And what, what you'll see also in that, that's not clearly articulated, but it's important of traditional knowledge. And so we wanna improve the management of our lands. We wanna improve water. We wanna build a capacity for our tribe staff to do this work. And finally, we want to protect our rights. So not only are we looking at the current boundaries of Rosebud, but we also want to look beyond that from a regional perspective as well, because our homelands still matter to us. We still have treaties. We still have treaty councils who still work on those being oaked on those big issues. And so that's important to us. Again, I mentioned the regional perspective. Um, There's been working now for the last few years on really strengthening something called the Ocheti Shanto and Oyate. And so you see that map there on the corner. Again, that's a, that's a delineation of Aboriginal homelands for Lakota people. And so there's an effort now to rebuild this regional regional effort. And so I've been promoting the idea of building it because we need it for climate adaptation. Also, we need it to, to monitor and, and uh, keep track of what's happening on that landscape. Plus, we want to look at you know land back issues and how do we return land and support our tribal sovereignty. Uh, again, this is all under uh, the umbrella of nation to nation relations. And so it's a big task, but I think it's important because, you know, when we talk about uh, treaties and talking about nation to nation arrangements and agreements, and then what we're facing as indigenous people, I think the Sochekti Shawi can be a regional player, if you will, in this part of the world uh, to advance, you know, using uh, best available science. I would say uh, best available traditional knowledge, working with those two knowledge systems really to advance uh, better decisions uh, because it's important. Uh, tribal sovereignty is a, it's important to our people yet today. So we have to we have to do this work. And I'm saying today that this work is going forward and we want to make this a reality. And so part of that reality is planning and getting together with other of the 17 tribes that uh, make up the Ocheti Shanko. And so this is work that's been done now for these past few years, but Give us an example of kind of how we're thinking about it, kind of what we're looking at using this logic model to understand kind of where we're at right now, um, where we want to go, and also what, what could be desired outcomes. And so if you look at it, some of the top things here of it is unity with one voice and outcome. Returning, uh, returning to Ocheki Shanko will unkbe, customary law. So customary law, traditional knowledge, obviously they're very close together the importance of, of uh, protecting and sustaining our languages. Another big important thing for us that, that makes us who we are as indigenous people. Again, talking about a clean environment, land sovereignty, and then don't forget our wellness. A lot of times we don't talk about the importance of wellness or health. And so that's an important part because we know uh, the demographics, we know the data on our health of indigenous people today. So we need to improve uh, for the for the betterment of all of us. And so this again shows um, strategic thinking. Uh, we want to work at the local level, the family level. That's the Tiwahe at the bottom part there, moving up to the Tioshpai, which is extended family, uh, the community level, the Oshpai, then to the Oyate or to the nation, and finally to the Ocheti Shantoi, the regional. And so there's been a lot of thinking here, knowing the risks and challenges we still face. But I want to share that with you again. This is work that's going on uh, that I'm part of that's applying uh, traditional knowledge. So then we uh, we look at different ways to do this work. And so I wanted just to highlight this Wolakota learning model again. When we think as partnerships and we think as tribes, indigenous people, you know, this first one that this first graphic, this first bullet is listen deeply. Uh, listen deeply. Uh, doings behind beings. Uh, we want to start and share deeply. 
and also beings before doing. So we recognize the importance of one another. And we believe that this model we've used for time immemorial is important to create the understanding. Now that we have to work across cultures, across borders, uh, we're always looking to go back into our old ways about how we did, how we did come to agreement and how we did uh, respect one another so that we can come to agreement. And so the Wolokota model again is another example of how we're using it. Not only we're using it, but the schools are using it with students and others uh, to create uh, you know, better learnings, better environments for learning, but also to carry forward our traditions and our customs. Also, I wanna share this other tool that's called ethical space. Uh, ethical space is work that was generated out of the truth and reconciliation work up in Canada. And so we've come to, I've come to in contact with this. I come to know that this is, I think a, a, a total a framework that we wanna to use to bring the traditional knowledge together with Western science. So we're doing this now and we're working with this now, but I think I wanna read these three bullets for you again. What is ethical space? It's a place of cultural safety, a place for knowledge system to interact with mutual respect, kindness, generosity, and other basic values and principles. Again, number two is we believe all knowledge systems are equal. That's an important point. All knowledge are equal. No single system has more weight or legitimacy than the other. The last bullet here says one system does not need the other to collaborate or to achieve um, internal validity. When I first saw this graphic and I heard these big, big ideas, I said, this is what we need. Because so many times I've heard this from science people saying, you know, we need to integrate traditional knowledge. We need to make them work together you know, to, to arrive at some decision or some new way. And I'm thinking also now too, that I don't know it necessarily have to fit. Uh, we know that they're different you know, and, and that's okay. Uh, we know they have integrity on their own. That's okay. Uh, respect those both systems. But use this ethical space to figure out how you do that, how you would how you bring them together in a, in a respectful way, you know, including tribal protocols, tribal principles to understand each other, so that, you know, as I mentioned in the Wolokota model, deeper learning can happen, and it begins with listening, and it begins with creating an environment to listen, and so that understanding and learning can happen in, in a good way. So because of that, you know, we we work with elders a lot and. I think if you want to really advance in your understanding of traditional knowledge, you cannot exclude um, American Indian elders. So this is a picture of the Lakota Studies Department at Sutta Glesh University, uh, taken probably about 15 years ago. And I, I share this because of the impact on me, uh, given my, uh, my, my task and my work today, uh, all these individuals here in, invested in me. And because they use story to teach me, uh, they talked in the Lakota language as I am a second uh, language learner right now, but I value that. And so they did that with me. Uh, it, we talked about genealogy, it's the importance of identity again, as indigenous people. And so Lakota studies people and the elders help, help so that for me, who I am, where I come from, my family, my relations. Uh, they taught us history, right? They teach us history uh, through their own experiences and through their own oral traditions. They bring and practice their cultural values to any project you may have, any presentation you have. Um, they'll bring those things and how they do their work. And obviously they're teachers. Uh, they're teachers, they're mentors, and they're guides and coaches. Each one of them brings their own gifts and talents, but they bring their culture with them. And that's very valuable. So I think if you have uh, these folks in the Crow uh, Canyon Archaeological Center, um, they're important, uh, but you also you get to recognize them of who they are as well. They're just, you know, just as much as a PhD person I know they're valued in our society. Uh, I think they need the same respect as well. And they need to be compensated the same as well because they bring another way of knowing and a very valid way of knowing. So uh, they're important. So keep them in mind, again, as you work to do your work with traditional knowledge. I think one of the things that's unique about, again, about uh, indigenous people in this continent is the role of buffalo or bison. So on the Rosebud, uh, we're working uh, to develop one of the largest herds, tribally led herds uh, in, in, in the country here. So Wolokota is a word again that we're using again to regenerate the indigenous ecosystem. So we recognize the buffalo as an important part. Uh, the, the buffalo, as you know, uh, was almost decimated, but it's making a recovery. And so it's great efforts now to bring back the buffalo. So we're one of the many tribes we're bringing back the buffalo because not only 
culturally and spiritually, but also um, because of what role they play on the land. And so we're excited about this work. It's a big project. Um, I understand again that again Buffalo can be uh, a climate mitigation measure as well because of how they can survive, but also how they take care of the land through what they do. So that's another again an example of the importance of thinking about this kind of work and the role of of of, uh, of, of bison in our, in that. Um, as I mentioned, um, part of this work also includes data, so traditional knowledge and, and, and data working together. Uh, we had our, our first uh, national summit here about a month ago in Boulder, and so where we brought together about 40 tribal representatives from the tribal colleges and tribal nations and tribal students came with other uh, data scientists around the country and universities. And we sat for three days uh, talking about the importance of including tribal nations, our needs, um, our desires, our visions for how to, we want to work with data and bring data into our decision making, into our education. And so we came up with some work teams. We came up with the importance of um, promoting uh, the issue of data sovereignty. So increasingly, you're going to be hearing that if you don't know it already. You're going to, we're all going to have to address that, the issue of data sovereignty. So it's important that you begin to do your own work in understanding what data sovereignty is and how that applies to your work. I'm, I'm probably assuming that the Crow Canyon already has a data sovereignty policy in place. Uh, to, and what that could be is agreements how data will be collected, how data will be stored, and how it will be owned or stewarded, and how it may be disseminated. And so we wrestle with a lot of those things as well at, at, at this. But the centers, I think the center is really interesting. The leadership there is including indigenous leaders in the leadership of the team. And so tribal priorities are important. Um, we, we're having our first uh, uh, NSF review after year one next week. So I'll be traveling to Boulder, Colorado to be a part of that and to share um, our tribal uh, engagement strategy and our vision uh, for how this uh, center can support our needs. Also, because as a consultant, I work with many different clients. Uh, one is government. And this is a new project I want you to be aware of. It's drought, uh, the importance of working with tribes to support their drought resilience. And so there's a tribal drought strategy that's in place now. We're working to update that. And we're hoping to hold a series of national uh, workshops, engagement workshops around the country this year and next year. I know the Southwest will be part of that. We're working on right now one for the uh, for the Missouri River Basin tribes there and their partners. So we're we're anticipating a September a workshop time frame to do that. It'll be open to to everybody. Uh, but again, it's 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 uh, reengaging. Um, it might be considered a travel drought in the Shady 2.0. And so I serve as advisor to this work. So I'm, de I'm deeply involved and how we do this work with tribes now, what we're learning, but also what we do, uh, what we do differently. But again, uh, these are principles, I think that tribes would agree that's important. Tribal data sovereignty, trust and reciprocity, uh, culturally appropriate early warning systems. Again, all things to support uh, tribal nation decision-making. Part of my work is, again, um, you know, I get called in to do consultation and facilitation. So I wanna share this cool, two cool pictures uh, of a new uh, land addition to the Wind Cave National Park in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And so I was asked with a partner to facilitate a travel consultation. Meeting. And uh, the, the general idea of this consultation was for tribes that have a uh, interest in the Wind Cave uh, land there. And because it's an important part of our, um, our, our creation story, that Wind Cave is part of our emergent story into, into this earth as we see it, as we know it. And to do that work required a consultation. So we did that. I did that. And out of that meeting came some pretty interesting uh, points of discussion, maybe even some conflict uh, to understand. So what do we do with this new addition of land to the park? How are we going to plan for it? Who decides? What if there are cultural and there are uh, cultural resources on this land here that we see? How are we going to work with that? And what are the current laws in place to protect those? But also what role do tribes have in interpretation? Uh, what do we want to, to share with the with the general public who visit Wind Cave through the years? And can we do something different here? Something different than the past to, to improve on travel work with national parks. And so, as you know, many know, there's a new director from uh, Sec Secretary Sam, Director Sam's, uh, the first tribal national park director, you know, really pushing from the top 
that parks need to be more responsive to tribes. So this exciting times again, um, we're still in the planning process for what this will be, but I wanted to share the importance of travel consultation, the importance of traditional knowledge in this work and how it applies to um, things that are happening right now. Also, I shared this graphic because I had a chance to, to meet uh, Secretary Deb Holland at a meeting uh, this year, and uh, she wrote this article that says the U.S. Secretary of Interior satellites will help fight climate change. So as we talk about traditional knowledge, we also have to, again, think about Earth observations, the role of satellites, and all that fit in together. Here we have the Secretary, the first Indigenous Secretary, uh, you know, instructing us, I think, in a very direct way that we need to use satellite data to help us with climate change. I'm so thankful for her leadership and because I work in Earth observation as well today and to see that the secretary talk about that to link climate change and tribes and earth observations is an important step so we hope that we can work with her uh, to advance what that would do how do we do that work uh, yes but how and so we're hoping that um, we, we can see progress there with our government in relation with tribes to use our observations for for that as well uh, i can't talk do this talk anymore without including our students and so i was part of a developing a new tribal climate leaders program at the University of Colorado Boulder. So those are the partners, the graphics on top. And this is Will Crawford of Dakota Man uh, from the Cincinnati Wapiton area in South Dakota. He just graduated this May with a master's uh, in climate science. And so this was his study. Uh, he did a study of Timsala or prairie turnips. And that's a quote from him. And so one of our jobs, all of our jobs here today is to recognize the importance of working with indigenous youth we encourage them to pursue advanced degrees. We encourage the schools to change, to make 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 it more accommodating to people like Will and others who are in this program. The Climate Re Chairman of Climate Leaders Program is an offshoot of North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, uh, fully funded. These fellowships were for five students. And so we have two graduated, and now three are in the pipeline. Two of those students are PhD students. So this Travel Climate Leader Program is there to get support to fully fund people like Will, so that way they can take that knowledge, take that training, and take that network forward and how he wants to work with his tribe in terms of protecting uh, Tumsala and all other cultural resources in the changing climate. He's a very impressive young man. I got to recruit him and be part of his uh, his his, um, his committee, his thesis committee, and it's an honor to work with him and other students that we have at CU Boulder. Part of this work also is to recognize the connection with indigenous work. So, so my work also works at the global level. So I was part of part of this co-founding of something called the Geo-Indigenous Alliance. And so this happened uh, about three years ago, almost four years ago now uh, in Australia. So I was invited to, to represent um, our country in my tribe there. You see my, my cool uh, name badge there. What an honor to give the intervention for our country and also for my nation. And I took my flag there with me to Australia as well. I met really these cool indigenous leaders from around the world. And we got in a room like this and we said, you know, we need to do something for ourselves, our nations in, our, in, in, in this area of geo. Uh, of geo. Uh, so we sat together for, for 10 days and we worked on crafting a vision for what can we do that's gonna advance our needs. And so we came up with that vision called to protect and sustain indigenous cultural heritage utilizing and contributing to global earth observations, data science and technology. We're still working together on this three years later. Uh, we have tremendous things online. You can go to our, our website, just Google Geodigious Alliance. You'll find uh, materials on some of our seminars. We held a summit, we've held workshops and we're working on a hackathon. So on the bottom there is hackathon. So hackathons are pretty cool things to bring together a student, an elder, a technologist, and a leader. And those four, four people, kinds of people, you know, form a, a team to build an app that meets the need of a local indigenous community, utilizing earth observations as well as traditional knowledge. So we're working on setting one up again for uh, 2023, 2024. And so again, this is working with indigenous youth around the world. Also, I wanna invite you, if people who are here are ecologists, uh, we have this cool event here. All these events here are happening at, at uh, Portland, Oregon here this, in August here, August 6th through what, August 6th through the 10th, um, Sunday through Friday. 
But just take a look at some of these titles. Again, I, I get to work with ESA. I'll be joining the governing board uh, in August of this year. Um, I was elected to that board last year. And so I think I'll, I'll be the first indigenous person to represent on that board. And so for the next three years of my term, I hope to include more indigenous knowledge into that work. If you know ESA, they're a very um, established, mature science organization. Uh, but now that things are changing in our world, particularly with indigenous people, indigenous knowledge, uh, they encourage me to, to run for the board and encourage to, to begin to work on some transformation things there in terms of policy and governance, funding, and really including tribal colleges, for instance, into ESA in a more deeper way. So I invite you uh, to this event, uh, 2023, Portland, Oregon, uh, August 6th to the 11th. And uh, you'll get to be part of this cool programming. And I'll be there, and as will other Indigenous scholars. So part of this work too is to um, is to meet indigenous partners at some at, I want to say halfway, but I'm not sure if it's halfway, but it's it's at some points where we have to come together, kind of get outside our comfort zone, all our comfort zones to tackle the issues in working with traditional knowledge of Western science. So um, so my partner and I, we started something called the called the Indigenous Engagement Institute. And so we'll be holding a series of workshops this coming year. And what you're seeing in front of you is a video. And uh, Taylor, I'm not sure if I clicked the sound when I'm thinking about this in the beginning of, of the share. So should I stop sharing and click that and do it again? Yeah, if you want to stop your screen share and then just re-click on and check those two bottom boxes, then you should be good to share that video. And if not, I've got it ready and I can hop on as well. Okay. I'm ready to go here. There's too much at stake. Climate justice, equity, sustainability, all of these issues demand a better way to engage the land. All of these issues demand a better way of engaging the rightful keepers of the land. The indigenous. But how? Learn. Learn in person. There's too much at stake. Climate justice, equity, sustainability. All of these issues demand a better way to engage the land. All of these issues demand a better way of engaging the rightful keepers of the land. The indigenous. But how? Learn. Learn in person from indigenous experts like Gwen Bridge, James Rattling Leaf Sr., and Rob Edward. How many civilizations have changed over the years? And ours is still the same. The stories are still the same. You know, maybe a little different from village to village, storyteller to storyteller, but the message is the same. Uh, we're going to have to look deep enough in terms of the role of cultural heritage and addressing climate. Our, our way of life is important, our spirituality is important. Get equipped for engaging in the ethical space, rooting out hidden biases, indigenous law, and more from the indigenous perspective. Reform your perspective on indigenous protocol and practice experiencing firsthand indigenous culture while being surrounded by the beauty of the Similkameen Valley. Effectively engaging the indigenous isn't only ethical, it is essential for all our relations, for our home and future generations. Register here today. So here's the, um... Here's a description of the workshop again. And again, it's uh, July 25th, 27th uh, on the Okanagan lands again. And again, it's, a, it's our effort and our contribution to this whole opportunity to work with indigenous knowledge and science and people in place. So I have this cool, um, cool little, uh, uh, um, it's people plus place, you know, plus purpose, plus protocol uh, equals progress. 
you know, teaching and training as I, as I am uh, with indigenous knowledge and, and people, it, it matters about place. And so because we've been in this COVID these last two plus years, uh, we do training online, but it's not the same, right? And so we hope that this 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 first work, this inaugural workshop here uh, through the IEI as a new startup, uh, it's gonna it's gonna do some good things. Um, people are gonna it's gonna do memorable things. It's gonna help advance understanding. It's gonna help go deeper and spend time together as as people, as human beings on the land in culture to advance uh, greater understanding. But we also have some online ones coming up too. And so we partner with Compass uh, in, in uh, Seattle, Washington. We, we do a lot of teaching with science uh, science people as well. And so we have one here on November 14th and 15th online as well. So again, you know, these are the things that we'll be talking about on the sign line one. So, so we're committed. We're committed to advance um, greater understanding through, through training, uh, through teaching and through capacity development, through mentorship, through coaching and, and those kind of things I think are important. That to advance greater understanding with TEK. So, again, some things that I think I want to leave you with again is it's important that we all understand that tribal nations are somewhat different than just another group of people. So, we got to commit to nation nation partnerships. Uh, we have to assert rights over data. Indigenous people uh, will continue to push for that, which I think is good. Uh, we need ethical data guidelines again. Uh, we need training. Uh, we need training to do this work. Uh, capacity development is important. Um, broadband infrastructure, as I mentioned, we cannot do this work without that. This whole idea of data repatriation, again, is an is an area that, that I think we, we're, we're tapping into as well. How do we, we repatriate data that was lost, that was taken? Um, how can we do that? Risk assessment. As you get into a project, you need to have a risk model to understand uh, what are those issues that you got to deal with. Um, again, we tribes you know, want to have free and prior informed consent. We need to substantially engage and consult. There's no shortcuts to tribal engagement. You've got to build relationships. Uh, I've spent 25 years of my life building relations with all kinds of people. And today it works. And when you do those things well, it works. You know, people will give you a hearing, you will listen, and you can do work. I think there's a need again for uh, in, in intellectual property rights in terms of what that really means for indigenous knowledge. And again, we'll keep pushing this idea of indigenous data. Uh, governance model in terms of tribes, uh, universities, partnerships, and such. What does that data governance model uh, look like? So we have to support that. So again, I will say culture matters, uh, dealing with indigenous knowledge, indigenous cultures, whether you're working home or international borders, got to build trust and, because it matters how you motivate, influence each other. And it matters whether you're successful or not in 21st century, because we're finding now that tribes are not at the same place we're growing, we're developing, and we're applying. And so it's important that you understand that. And so I'll stop there and say, hey, Chegla, uh, that's enough. And thank you um, for your time and listening. So Wopilatanka, Chishapalo. Thank you all very much. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, James. That was that was spectacular. Uh, so much incredible content in there and and frameworks moving forward. I, there there's a lot of places that we could start with questions. It looks like we have about about seven minutes or so. And I do um, uh, want to maybe invite uh, uh, Becky and and John if if you all are still on. If you had to, to go first, if you had some some questions or observations that that you would like to uh, put out there. Uh, you're muted, Becky. Sorry. <laughs> so, so um, James, I was just kind of curious, like, you know, um, with all your workshops, um, other stuff, do you do you come to communities and are able to actually model it um, mm. for for that reservation? You know, so that you know that that right. workshop fits with what what the community needs are. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and thank you for that. You know, you know, so for the the works that we're doing in person in Samilkami, you know, that's that's built around a lot of the of the Okanagan culture, and a lot of the participants that we've seen are are working in that area or that region, uh -huh. and so there's a real connection there, which we think is important is uh, how we design our training, but also like the ethical space framework, you know, that's that can be applied in in other cultural contexts or other tribal contexts too. 
So, but we got to start someplace and, and grow that and develop that curriculum, co-develop that with the tribes, indigenous knowledge holders, and the mm -hmm. people you saw in that video. There are people already engaging with ethical space as a framework to help make decisions. So that's important. Um, I think that as as the participants will come and as as we anticipate they'll what they'll learn is that you know they'll they'll have another important data point that we're not going to, they can't teach them everything in two and a half days, but I think yeah. we can give them, we can encourage them. We can give them what we know at this point in time, because we know things change, right? But also we know that, um, that we can also give them and motivate them to take the next right step in their development to work with tribal nations, which I think mm -hmm. is important. So, and we do that in community, right? So there'll be other leaders there and they'll hear from one another. They'll hear their own concerns. The hill level experience. So we're trying to build a community as well. So IEI is going to build a community of people who've gone through our training. They, they get to know us a little bit better, spend time with us. And so we're going to work with them. We're going to co-develop. We're going to we're going to evaluate and, and we're going to, you know, have these touch points all along the line. So you saw a one and done deal. We see this as a transformational experience. So we want to take this to different parts of the world. And so we'll plan this right now where we're at for July. And we'll be working on, we're working on a second one right now at a place that is going to be reflective of that. Like it could be in the Black Hills of South Dakota. There's some, so many things going on here in the Black Hills, like mining, uh, drought, climate change, growth, um, and you know, land rights, you know, land back movements here. It's the center of many things here. So we can envision having something here as well, again, tailored uh, to those issues relevant uh, to this part of the country as well. So it's a great it's a great question and um again we're learning as we go so we don't anticipate all the all the answers but we know that um but we know some things about bring you know, cultural together bring ceremony together bring practice together at a beautiful place with with the right purpose i think we can make progress great thank you uh do you mind if I just add something here um I, as you probably i'd like for you to answer the questions that you probably see but I think the underlying uh, premise in which you're, you're helping us understand is really that we as indigenous communities have that inalienable right to exist. Mm -hmm. We have that sovereignty, which unfortunately sometimes either the federal government, state governments, or some entity isn't always easy to recognize. And we have to continually to fight for that, much like you see the questions on the water rights. Well, mm -hmm. as long as some entity, in this particular case, the Supreme Court, as long as they recognize our right to exist, our right to the knowledge, to the wisdom, and what are all the things that follow, as long as we have that first premise that we have that right, we don't always have to prove it. We don't always have to fight for it. And so I think all that knowledge you help us understand is that crux of that core concept that we have. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great thought for sure. And I would agree with that. You know, that's why I think this, the role of UNDRIP and those kind of things are important in terms of frameworks for understanding, as you said, our, our the right to exist as who we are uh, since time immemorial and bringing those, you know, those deeper types of uh, concepts and principles that, that we've that governed us for many years, like natural law and those sort of things. You know, we want to approach those things, but always um, with the holders of that, you know, it's, it's not going to necessarily be me doing it, but we work with others who hold that knowledge, who want to work in this space and who want to do this work uh, in a training or capacity development mode, but also knowing that we need to do it. So, you know, in our communities, you know, we have diversity of opinion of how much do we share with the world. Some tribes, you know, hold on to it really close. Other tribes are willing to share. It happens to be my Lakota culture. Um, you know, we share, uh, we include. And, but that's our right to do that right? and our things. You as Joe, as your tribe, as you mentioned, you have your right to share what you share. So people have to understand that too. We're not all the same. Our histories are different. Our, um, you know, our, 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 um, our backgrounds are different. And even where we're at today, maybe different. We have tribes that are developing oil and gas. You know, we talk about the land, but they're developing oil and gas. I mean, do we have a right to say, hey, that's not right, or that's wrong, or you're not treating mother earth right. See, so who gets to decide? <laughs> But that's but that's the challenge for our partners because then they're confused. Like, what is this? Do you need to exactly. talk about the land? You talk about all this stuff, and then you and then you see this happening over here. Then you see like we're fighting pipelines, but yet tribes are developing here. And so, how how do they view that? Right? 
So that's why we have to have these, uh, these, these conversations, these forums, these dialogues, and to write. Uh, we need to publish these things in a way too. That's why I'm working with the ESA. You know, we're gonna coming out with some new journals focusing on indigenous scholarship, indigenous knowledge. So we're, we're anxious to, 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 to develop that new journal coming up where Indigenous scholars who need to publish for their careers will have a place, another place to bring that. And we'll have review editors that understand Indigenous knowledge in terms of, of academia or, or in terms of um, publishing and research. So there are things that are happening in our world that hasn't happened before. And we as Indigenous people are part of that today. And I think it's important to recognize and honor all those contributions who came before us who didn't have the opportunities we have today. So we have to take this opportunity today in advance. And we do that in our in our own tribal and cultural ways. As you can see, the some of the questions there, they would like your response or your reaction to the Supreme Court's decision on oh. <laughs> the Supreme Court upholding our neighbors, our Navajo neighbors, our Diné yeah. neighbors, their right to their water. So uh, I'll let you answer that. Boy, that's all. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. So first of all, I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I, I don't have the legal background, but but I guess I guess I see like the decision, right? It was five four. It was five four. It wasn't all unanimous, it was five four. So it was dissent, right? So that gives me hope that that maybe some of those justices somehow still understand the importance of tribal sovereignty and the importance of treaties and how they're interpreted today. Um, I think that again, there's a recognition again that um that it's a risk to take our, our stuff to the Supreme Court because we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, we had ICWA, the, the Indian Child Welfare Act, you know, get strengthened, get reaffirmed. We had just had that way a couple of weeks ago. And now we have this Navajo case now taking us backward again. So we live in perilous times as indigenous people when we take those kind of issues to the Supreme Court because we don't know how they're going to. And some people, wow, well, we knew we were going to, but at the same time, it's a great risk because that affects you know those are those are impacts to going forward and so i think um you know i don't have a good response um i think it's a disappointment for sure but i think um we just we got to grow our, our our abilities we got to grow our our knowledge as indigenous people we got to keep keep fighting because i think that's our responsibility keep advocating uh keep articulating why that matters to us why our water rights matter so each one of us then has a responsibility to talk about that supreme court and to, and to tell people again why it matters. So we need to publish. We need to have these platforms, right? These communication platforms to talk about this and to do it in a, in a deep way, in, in a in an intellectual way as well, and in a cultural way, because we know that the Colorado River is important to your tribe, tribes in the Southwest. And so what happens there will happen to us in the Missouri River. We have not adjudicated our water rights on the Missouri River as Lakota people. That day is coming where we, well, I think we'll have to, we'll be forced to, Right now, we don't want to quantify our water rights because we're afraid due to climate change that we'll reach our capacity and so many of us going to turn off the novel there and we'll no longer get no more water. So those are big issues that uh, we've got to tackle. That's why I'm promoting the Ochete Shankoni as a regional framework, promoting the role of data because we need it to, to document, to even if we want to enforce and develop policies around those non-Indigenous people who live on our lands, we need that data, you know, to, to, uh, to, to issue permits and to enforce. And to, so we need that data as well as other things. So those are some of my thoughts to a big, 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 big deal uh, in this court case. Wonderful. Thank you so much, James. I, uh, we're um, about almost five minutes over and I want to be respectful <laughs> of your, of your time. Uh, and Thank you so much. We will definitely be uh, be in touch and hopefully be able to to do some collaborations with you as our as our goals are 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 definitely aligned um, with with the good work that you're doing and what you're yeah. pursuing. So, thank you so much. Yeah. And um, uh, we will make uh, those of you if there are questions that weren't addressed, we will pass them along to James. And we will. You have a standing invitation to visit Crook Canyon oh, okay. anytime. <laughs> Just make sure you guys feed me some good fry bread. Oh yeah, we, we and, green, and green chilies and all I kinds read of that green chili chili. Yeah, I love that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you everybody. Good okay, time. thanks so oh, much. Yeah. 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 Thank you to John and Becky too. Thanks. Bye everybody. Join us next week. Don't forget, join us next week. Absolutely. <laughs>